Good morning, Pine Castle. The same way that David is not John, I am also not Pastor Scott, but I am very happy to see you here today. And I still have my mask on. I can take it off because I'm on stage. You know, one cool thing that I've, and this is going to be actually really hard for me to take off, I think, because of the microphone. Mic check? Cool. I've got, before we dig into it, I don't get to talk to you guys as much as I used to, so I've got a few just observations and just a few things to, to say that aren't really super related to my message, but I think are related to God. And one cool thing that I've noticed since March, um, back when this whole thing started, right, is what a great tool a mask can be to show someone that you care about them when you don't have to. It's interesting, right? Like, I really hate wearing my mask. I absolutely hate it. Especially, and I don't know, especially because I wear glasses, right? I wear glasses and, right? I just can't see anything when I breathe. And it's, I don't like it. But you know what is, is better than wearing a mask or what would be harder than wearing a mask is, is going to die on a cross, right? And because Christ was willing to do that for me, I have an opportunity to even voice my displeasure for wearing a mask and tell people how much I don't like it, and then at the same time wear it and show them that I love them. Because not everybody has my same political views, and not everybody has the same views that I have about healthcare. There's so many more things today to have views about than there's in my life ever been, and I'm, we, we haven't all had the same lives, but I've never had the opportunity to be so opinionated as I do today and I want to make sure that the opinions that I hold and the way that I display them, first and foremost, show people that I love them because Christ loved them first, Amen. right? So don't take that as condemnation. That's just how I've been using my mask as a ministry tool for the past few months. And I, if you have the ability to, I encourage you to do the same. Not to wear it, to use it as a tool. And that's all I'll say about that. Um, but I've got a, lot, a couple other things. I have to apologize first and foremost because when I was asked to preach today, the first thought in my head is, man, I'm going to miss the election. I would love to talk right before the election. <laughs> and what do you know? The big guy upstairs decided, well, we'll just hold the presidency for Jared <laughs> so that he can talk without knowing who the president's going to be yet. So uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you guys had to deal with it for a couple more weeks, but I didn't realize when I thought that the impact that it would have. Now... Two, two years ago, I got to preach right before um, the gubernatorial race. Um, seems like, I thought it was one year ago. I had to actually go to the internet to see how long ago it was because life's just moving so fast right now. And I said something, and I got a couple um, comments afterwards. I said that God's not a Democrat, right? And then I also said, but he's also not a Republican, right? And that is still true today. And I really loved the sign that Scott showed a couple weeks ago um, about John Wesley's rules to an election. And at the end of all of this, there's going to be two outcomes. We are either going to have acted in a way that brings people closer to God or in a way that has not. And I'd, I've seen some Facebook posts, not from people in this room, but from people who, if you click on their Facebook and you go, the first thing it says on the top is Christian, right? Right? But the post that you had to click on to get to their profile wasn't very Christian. It was very Republican or very Democrat. And I think it's important, especially in this time of the year, to remember that first we should identify as children of God, a God who came to, to earth to die for people of all political parties and all religious walks of life, not as our political party first. And I think sometimes, especially in November, we forget those things. So I'm fortunate enough that God, you kind of drew out the elections that I could remind you guys this morning. Um, what's important to remember is what God says in Matthew, right? He says, when the son of man comes as the king and all the angels with him, he will sit on his royal throne and the people of all nations will be gathered before him. Then he will divide them into two groups just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the other goats. He will put the righteous people on his right hand and the others on the left. The king will say to the people on his right, come, you that are blessed by the Father, come and possess the kingdom which you have been, has been prepared for you ever since creation of the world. 
And here's why he will say that, because when I was hungry, you fed me, and thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you received me into your homes. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, you took care of me, in prison, and you visited me. We are the church, right? And I think if the church, not this church specifically, okay, but the church as a whole, did more of the things that are listed in this passage, there would be far less debate about what the government's job was. It is the church's job to feed the hungry, visit the sick, visit those in prison, give drinks to the thirsty, both physically and spiritually. And sometime, and I can't pinpoint it down, but in the past hundred-ish years, we kind of dropped the ball a little bit. And I think that's a large reason why no one knows whose job it is to do those things. Just another observation, all right? That's not what I'm preaching about this morning. Those are just some, some things that I had that I wanted to talk about. They've been on my heart a lot lately. Um, and they've been on my heart a lot because of the message that we're going to preach today. So before we dive into what we're talking about today, and as you know, Bruce and the worship team so wonderfully saying, we're talking about the hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, right? So before we dive into that, will you guys pray with me one more time? Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you this morning, and we just thank you so much that your word is still alive, still living, still relevant, and still powerful today. God, as we take some time here in the next few minutes to dig into it corporately together as a family, God, we pray that you just continue to make it alive to us. God, as we visit stories and verses that we all know well, God, make them new and fresh and alive to us once again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, Take My Life and Let It Be um, is a hymn by Francis Havergale, and there's it's in, your, it's in your, your notes right here, right? We're gonna do a little bit of bouncing back and forth today. We've got some notes on the front, we've got some notes on the back, or conversely, because we're open to all opinions, we have some notes on the back and some notes on the front. I don't know which part is which of the paper, but there's notes on both sides. One has the hymn, I've got some circles. The other has some blanks for us to fill in this morning. So we're gonna dig into this um, together as a group. Now, one thing to call out, on this side of your notes, the one with the blanks, there's some blanks and some supporting scriptures. We're gonna get to the supporting scriptures, but what I want everyone to do is go to your Bible, electronic, paper, however you have it, memory, if you're really that good. That gives everybody who doesn't have a Bible like an out, like I'm one of the memory people. All right, and go to Acts chapter six. All right. Go to Acts chapter 6. Now, today we're going to be talking about the story of Stephen. Now, Stephen in the Bible is someone who did what Francis Havergale says in this hymn should be done. He said, take my life and let it be. And as we dive through this story, you'll see it aligns nicely with the hymn. And there are things that God wants from us. So if we look at the hymn the first stanza, it says, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and take my days. My life, my moments, my days. Right? This, in this hymn, this is Francis saying, God, my time belongs to you now. My time belongs to you. And I think this is interesting and it's fitting because here, let me just dive into this a story real quick. So in March, I think it was March 13th, I worked for the last day in my office to date. Still working from home, right? A lot of people right around that same time lost their jobs or had their jobs completely change. They were no longer allowed to take the trips they had planned. They were no longer able to go to the park they weren't able to go to Disney. They weren't able to go to the movies. You could go grocery shopping still. Some people didn't even do that. They started getting groceries delivered. You couldn't go out to dinner. You couldn't do 
anything, right? It's almost like our great heavenly administrative assistant said, these people are getting too busy, let's clear the schedule. Let's clear the schedule, right? And he did that, I believe, right? I believe that God said, too busy, let's clear the schedule. And that has allowed us to have more time now than we've ever had before. I don't drive to work in the morning. I don't drive home from work at night. I haven't traveled for work. There's a lot of things, and a lot of people have had even more time than that because they don't have any work to do anymore. And the question is, is with that increased time, what have we done with it? Let's look, let's look here, right? So Acts chapter six, it says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews were among them, among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples and said, it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, Choose seven men from among you who, you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them, and we will give our attention in prayer and ministry of the word. This proposed plan pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Also, Philip, Procurus, Nic- Nicanor, Timon, he's, I know him from the Lion King, <laughs> Permenus and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. So you've got these 12 disciples, right? The, the 12, right? We've heard of them before. If you look around, they're still around today, right? We've got them on the windows. They're getting so busy that they're starting to drop the ball in some places, right? And it's not like they forgot to let the dog out. Right? They forgot to feed some widows. Important. That's an important thing. So, amen. I pre- yes, I agreed. So, everyone's kind of getting upset. Maybe there's some like harsh conversations going on. They're like, we didn't, you know, we didn't get our food. They're like, okay, we can't handle all of this. And God is calling us to continue to minister for the word. Who has more time? Who has more time? So they find these seven folks who are full of the spirit and full of wisdom, and they say, you guys are the perfect ones for the job, and everybody is happy. So I want you guys to see, the first blank here is T for time. God wants our time. And the first thing that Stephen does, right, to be marked as a man full of God's spirit and full of God's wisdom is say, God I am available. I'm available. And there's two different people in the story, two types of different types of availability. You've got the disciples on one hand who are busier than ever, right? COVID has done that to some people. They're busier than they've ever been. Things are going faster and faster and it's getting crazier and crazier. And they said, God, we still want to be available for what you called us to do preaching the word and doing God's work. So we need some other people who are also available to minister to the widows in the community. And that's where these seven came in. The first thing that God is saying today is, would you say take my life and let it be? I want your time. Give me your time. Just give me a little bit of your time and watch what I can do. Give me a little bit. Just start with a toe. Just dip a toe in. Maybe you're not giving me anything now. Maybe you're out there and you're giving 90% already. Take my time and let it be. T is for time. God is saying today, give me your time and see what I can do with it. As we move on through the story, oh, we've got a supporting verse here. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Making the most of every opportunity. And that's what Stephen was doing here. He said, there's an opportunity to feed the hungry. Take my life and let it be. 
There's an opportunity here. God, take my time and let it be. As we continue um, down, the, down the story here, or down the, uh, let's, go, let's go to the verse, right? The next thing it says is, take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful. Swift and beautiful. God, take my hands, take my feet. He goes on and says, take my voice and let me sing. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. So take my hands, take my feet, take my voice, take my lips. God is saying, and I've got it in two points over here. He's saying, don't just give me your time, give me your actions, hands and feet, and give me your words, right? Voice and lips. And here's where we go, on to Stephen, right? So they chose Stephen, full of spirit and wisdom to help. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, went out and he performed great wonders and signs among the people, right? Those are his actions. He didn't just say, God, here's my time. Let me, you know, study some flashcards. Here's my time. Let me, and this is a healthy habit. Here's my time. Let me read more of my Bible in, in my bedroom by myself. He said, God, not only am I going to give you my time, but I am also willing to go and do something publicly for you. I'm going to allow the time that I give you to motivate the actions that I take. So Stephen went out and he performed great wonders and signs among the people. And here's, here's where it gets interesting. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue, freed men, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Sicilia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. Now get this, right? You've got Stephen, who is a Christian, right, follower of Christ on one side, and then you've got this other political faction from the synagogue on the other, and they don't agree, and they come from all around to argue, right? The Bible is not applicable for where we are today. There's no similarities whatsoever. (laughs) Winking for you online, okay? We're here. We're still here. We're still here. They came from all around. These people literally, because there was no social media back then, they were traveling great distances to come and find Stephen to argue with him. Okay. Let me step back. Selfishly, I know a lot of you pretty well. I know my family up here in the front row. They know me very, very well. This is something that, man, if God called me to just go out and argue with people, like, What a job, huh? What a job. But these people come from all around, and here's what I love at the end. They began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. He did great miracles. He performed great works. People came from all over to debate and to argue with him, but then He used the words given to him by the Spirit to speak to them in a way that they could not stand against his arguments. Now, who has ever been in an argument? The the way to win an argument or a debate with someone who has different views as you is not to yell them into submission. It's not to shout at them. It's not to try and prove how right you are especially when you're debating about this, it's to show how much God loves them, right? And so as he's speaking with the words of the Spirit, you have to imagine what he's saying to these people who are arguing with him so that they can't stand against his argument. He's saying, look at how much God has loved you. From the beginning to now, and he gets into this later, we we can dive in and see more of what he was actually talking about. From Abraham to now, God was here, and God was here. And remember when Israel fell away? God was there. And remember when they fell away this time? God was there. 
And now, God sent Jesus because he loves you, his son, the Messiah, right? His argument was not one of, well, listen to these reasons why you're wrong. It was, listen to how much God loves you. So not only does God want our actions, but God also wants our words. He wants our time, our actions, and our words. And where it gets really cool here, this is, and we'll, we'll do another one of these switches, is if you give God your time and you give God your actions, he will then start taking your words. He will start taking your words and the things that you say because you've devoted your time and your actions to him will just start becoming what he would say. They will start becoming words of the Spirit. You will start becoming full of the Spirit because you've already decided to say to God, take my time and let it be. Take my actions, let them be. Your words, God, take my words and let them be. And it just starts to happen. Again, that's not where it ends with Frances Havergal. She dives in more, and this is a really cool, this is a really cool point. So the next thing that, that she writes is, take my silver and take my gold. Not a mite would I withhold. Take my silver and take my gold. Not a mite would I withhold. Silver and gold are valuable, very valuable. And I want you to think about Stephen and where he was in his life. He was a newly appointed deacon of a church. Not us, a church. At this point, this is the church, right? There's only only the church. And he's a newly appointed deacon. He's going out. He's performing miracles. He's full of God's power. He's full of God's spirit. And this is a story that we've seen play out many times in recent history where you have this hot shot preacher, right? I don't say that in a bad way, like somebody who is bringing the word, like boom, 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 and people are coming to Christ and they're falling on their faces and they're really repenting and coming to God, and before you know it, someone attacks what's most valuable to them, and in that scenario, the thing that really holds a lot of value in their life is their reputation. And that's what happens here to Stephen, right? So these people who could not beat him in these arguments, they stirred the people up, and elders and teachers of the law, they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified falsely, right? False witnesses. This fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down. They are attacking Stephen's reputation. They're, they're lying about him. And Stephen says, God, if you want my reputation, you can have that too. I don't know what's most valuable to you. Honestly, if I wasn't married with a daughter, it'd be hard for me to know what was most valuable to me. It takes some real soul searching to understand what it is that you find most near and most dear and most valuable to your life. But the question that I have this morning is, if God came and said, I need that too, Oh, that's tough. God, you know, I can give you my time. I can give you my time. I can dedicate some time to feeding the widows and the orphans in, in, in God's name. I can do that for you. And you know what? If you want me to step out and boldly, you know, say something in public and I, and I know that you want me to do it, I can, even, I can do that for you too. And I know you'll give me the words because I've already said I'll dedicate my words to you. Oh, but my most valuable possession, I don't know. And imagine being, and this isn't in my notes, imagine being Abraham, right, and saying, I need need your your son. Like, that's the most crazy example. And, you know, I've got an almost 17-month-old daughter, which is crazy to think about, because she was just born, like, two days ago. But, 
And I'm sure everybody else knows exactly what I'm talking about. But if he said, like, we need her, even today, standing up here right now, like, I hope that I'm, my heart's prepared for that, but I don't think it is. To be completely honest, I don't think it is. Or if he said, you know, Jared, you've got to quit your job and sell your house, and we want you to take your family and travel from city to city and have no income to do it and just kind of hope that everything works out, like, and then there's a chance that my wife and daughter are on the street homeless with me. That's hard. That's hard, folks. There are things in our lives that mean so much. Maybe in some cases, not even too much. They mean the right amount, but are we willing to say, God, I believe that you are more than that. I believe you mean more than that. I trust you more than that. I'm not saying I'm there, I'm saying exactly the opposite, I'm not there. But as a group, that's what God is calling us. God, take my life and let it be. Take my silver, take my gold, they're yours, my most valuable possessions. It's hard, that's a hard, no, that's hard. And then to the same verse that David spoke about earlier, it says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And the same way that Francis in this song, when she says, take my silver, take my gold, is not only speaking about physical wealth, so is Jesus here in this message. Don't store up your treasure. Now, while it would be great to have a treasure chest full of gold coins, I don't have one, and that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the things that I love and hold most dear. And I should keep those in heaven, not here on earth. That's where my valuables should be. Point number four, and as we continue down the hymn, Take my intellect, and I stopped kind of halfway through the stanza there, so just so you know. Take my silver, take my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Then the next point, take my intellect and use every power thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my intellect and take my will. The T here on the next blank stands for thoughts. Take my thoughts. And this is like where it's so cool. At this point, Stephen has said, God, let me be available for you. Please take my time. God, use me as you will. Take my actions. God, let me speak for you. Take my words. They can destroy my reputation. I don't care. My valuables are yours. Let me serve you. And when all of that comes into line, God then comes in and says, give me your thoughts too. And Stephen says, I'm an open vessel. Take my thoughts. And he just wrecks these guys. Like, I can't get excited enough about it, right? So in at the end, it says, all who were sitting with the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen. This is when they brought Stephen before the Sanhedrin. It's like their court of law, right? And they say, you know, you've been false. They were, they're falsely testifying. It's like, you've been saying that Jesus came to destroy, that Moses isn't worth anything. You're twisting everything. You're not good. You're bad. Right? They're just getting Stephen. And then the Sanhedrin looks at Stephen, and all who were sitting there looked intently at him, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. They saw that his face was the fa like the face of an angel. Now, they saw his face was the face of an angel. 
and they're amazed, like what is gonna happen? And this is the last verse in chapter 16, and then in chapter 17, he, or seven, sorry, six, and then in seven, I put an extra one there for no reason. He jumps in in the next chapter into this torrent of just God's voice speaking through Stephen. It says, God was there with Abraham, and God was there with Elijah, and God was there with Elisha, and God was there, boom, 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 and he goes on. It's 53 verses of him just telling the Sanhedrin why Christ is the Messiah, and they are so against it that by the end, it says they're covering their ears and gnashing their teeth in disagreement. So they're literally giving him like a four-year-old, like la, 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 la. That's how full of God's spirit he is. And like, I, I encourage you all to read it this week, right? It's, a, it's 53 verses, so I'm not going to read it right now because it's almost 1130 and they get out of church at 11.30, so I wanna make sure that we're close to being at lunch first. But it's 53 verses of him just dropping the hammer of God's love and God's word on the Sanhedrin. And I want to, to say here, like while he's doing that, he's not thinking like, Ugh, remember that guy who, who cut me off last week? He's not distracted with, Oh, what am I going to do next month when I've got to pay my mortgage? He's not distracted with, oh, you know, what am I going to do about, you know, Lucy down the road? He's not, he's not distracted with his thoughts because he's fully consumed with God's thoughts. Just like here in 2 Corinthians, it says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. That's Stephen here. He is able to deliver this powerful, powerful message because he's holding every thought captive to Christ because sequentially he has set himself up in a pattern, in a habit, in a habit of saying, God, take my life and let it be. Take this part. You want that part? Take it too. You want this part? Go for it. God, I'm going to be available for you. I'm going to be available today for what you have for me. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is. I'm going to be available for you. Bruce, can you come back up here for me? Thank you. Look, as we get ready to move towards the closing of this message, there's a few things that I want to make sure that I have clear. No one wakes up on a, on a Monday morning, which is the next time we're gonna be waking up in the morning, good Lord willing, and says, I was, I was nowhere, I was, I've not started on this process and today I'm gonna to say, God, take my life and let it be, and boom, that's it. Right? No one goes from living their own life and holding their own life tight to saying, God, take my life and let it be, and then in an instant, they no longer have to worry about struggling with their time or their valuables or their actions, or their words, or their thoughts. So I don't want you out there to think like, well, pff, I haven't even started this, so I can't just say, take my life and let it be, because I'm so far down the road. You know, there's, this, there's a saying that it says, you know, how do you eat an elephant, right, one bite at a time? Or how do you, you know, how do you run a marathon, or just one, one step at a time? That's this journey. That's this road. No one's going to, to go from where you are to God, take my life and let it be, and then boom, it's done. It's one step at a time. God, today I pray that you take my words. I was struggling with that yesterday. God, tomorrow I pray you know, that you take my valuables. I, I saw what my priorities looked like yesterday. I saw what I was putting first, and I'm almost embarrassed by it. 
it's one step at a time. And I love what the last stanza here says. It says, Take my love, my Lord. I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee. All. What does God want? That's it. Just everything. Just everything. And how do we do that? We do it one little bit at a time. God, today, make me more like you. God, today, change my heart. Now, here's, here's the deal. It, I went through time, actions, words, valuables, thoughts. There are infinitely more things that God wants from you. Infinitely more. God wants your internet browsing history. Right? God wants your conversations on Facebook. God wants your driving habits. He wants your anger management course. He wants your beverage consumption history. He wants all of it. Like yesterday, to tell on myself a little bit, I worshiped hard at the church of college football and the Masters. I did, right? There's a lot of church going on yesterday, the Masters, the Masters weekend. So you got college football and the Masters on the same day. Kind of convicting standing up here this morning telling you guys that God wants everything from you. When what did I give him, what did I give him yesterday? One step at a time. Where did this lead Stephen, right? Where did this lead Stephen? As they're gnashing their teeth, right? The members of the Sanhedrin heard this. They were furious. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus, standing at the right hand of God, look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. At this they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed him. They dragged him into the streets, and then paraphrasing the end, and they stoned him. Stephen made it. One step at a time, he lived his life in a way where he was prepared when his number was called to give God everything. Where I am in my life right now, I hope God doesn't ask that of me. But I hope that if he does, I have lived my life in a way and I understand his glory, his power, and his will in a way that I would say, God, here's my life. Take my life and let it be. I mentioned a second ago the infinite number of things that we could give to God, that we could say, God, take my blank and let it be. Grab onto one of those things right now. Grab it, you can write it down, you can hold it in your head, and whatever you want to do. And if you've got something, right, if you've got something there, I want you to pray with me. As we close, I want you to pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you this morning. And along with Francis, along with Stephen, along with all the saints that have gone on before and those who are here today, God, we say, take my life and let it be. God, take me, use me, Make my heart available to you. Make my words available to you, God. All of what I am, take me and use me for your glory, for your purpose, and to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So now, Pine Castle, with that 
please go in his power and his presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, Pine Castle.